Okay, so we talked about the aerial sequel sphincter, and we I talked about most sphincters are just round muscles, and then when they close and they hold tight, they prevent food from moving from one area to the next. What was so special about this one? It works like a valve, right? So instead of being instead of just opening and then closing, opening and closing, this one actually moves inward to the cecum, which is in the, the colon, colon, and it works like a valve, so nothing can move backwards, just like this. So all the bacteria that's in there, all the you know processed food, everything, none of it can go backwards. Next is the sucus enterocris. This is a secretion. This literally means the juice of the intestines. So this is from the lining of the small intestine. It's there for lubrication. It's not there for processing food. It's not there with enzymes. It's just there as a lubricant. That's all it's there for. Where are most of the enzymes that are processing food in the small intestine? Where do they come from? They're not from the small intestine. They're from some other organ. The what? The pancreas. They're from the pancreas. The proteolytic enzymes, the amylase, the lipase, those are all from the pancreas. This secretion that's coming from the small intestines is just for lubrication. So it pushes out about another liter and a half of salty mucus. Where's this borrowed from? The plasma. Man, have I beat that one to death or, yet, or what? But look at all the things secreted. You've got hydrochloric acid and pepsin coming out from the um, stomach. You have saliva, about two liters a day, coming from the mouth. In the pancreas, you have about two liters of that sodium bicarbonate solution. Now you have about one and a half liters of sucus entericus. All this stuff is borrowed from the plasma. That's like seven liters worth of fluid. How is that possible? How can the blood that's only five liters push out seven liters of fluid? Because what's constantly being happen, or happening? It's being returned, it's being recycled. This is like this continuous stream. You push fluids into the GI tract, but then you're reabsorbing them at the same rate. So they're constantly being exchanged back and forth. Right. Oh, and then what stimulates this is just by moving chyme into the small intestine. The presence of chyme, mechanoreceptors detect the chymes there, they stretch out the small intestine, the small intestine pushes this mucousy like substance back. It's almost like if you catch a worm coming out of the ground. How many people have ever done that? Man, you didn't live as a child if you didn't. When you grab a hold of a worm as it's coming out of the ground, what's it start doing? It tries going back down and it releases this what stuff? This like slimy, mucousy stuff. Right? When you stimulate the surface of that worm, it starts secreting the, sl the slimy stuff. It's the same thing with the small intestine. When you push food in the small intestine, it starts secreting the slime to lubricate the pathway. Okay, so digestion in the small intestine. We've talked about secretions. We've talked about movement coming through, motility. And now the digestion. Most of the digestion is happening in the lumen, in the hollow core, and it's because of enzymes released from the pancreas. But... As you're moving the food across that final wall to get it into the bloodstream, there are a couple little enzymes that, that like line the wall, that are on the wall. Right? And this one of those groups is for breaking down carbohydrates. So it takes things like disaccharides. Disaccharide means it has how many sugars on it? Two. How many do you have to have to be able to absorb it? Just one. So these disaccharides you've been breaking down with amylase, they're still too big to be absorbed. So when this food gets to the wall of the intestine, I don't know if I have a picture. When it gets right here to the wall of the intestine, it has to be split in half. You take that disaccharide and you cleave it in half to make two monosaccharides, then you bring those in. Can you think of an example of one disaccharide that some people can't actually break in half? I said it the first day of digestion. Lactose. When people are lactose intolerant, they're, they're missing the enzyme to break lactose in half. They don't have it. So it stays in their intestine for longer. All right, so carb digestion. The other one is a proteol proteolytic enzyme. So what's it breaking? Proteins. It's taking small pieces of proteins that aren't small enough yet. Those little proteins are called, anybody know what the word is? It starts with a P. Peptides. So it's taking these little peptides that are small proteins and it's cleaving them into the last segments, which are what's? What are the smallest structural pieces of proteins? The amino acids. So these are happening at the actual brush border wall or the wall of the small intestine. Most of the digestion happened in the lumen, but two things have to happen at the wall. Disaccharides get broken into monosaccharides and peptides get broken into amino acids. What's the only nutrient that we haven't mentioned yet that's broken on the wall? Lipids, because lipids aren't broken at the wall. Lipids are broken in the lumen by lipase. 
Once those lipids get to the wall, they're fat. Do they need a transporter or anything to move them across the wall? Nope, they can just move or diffuse right through the wall. So the lipids aren't broken on the wall. The lipids are actually broken in the lumen of the small intestine. So that's the digestion, the three major pieces of digestion. Right, so here they are, and like I said, disaccharide ACEs, what's that telling you? Disaccharide ACE. It's an enzyme. It's an enzyme breaking apart the disaccharides. It's taking maltase, sucrase, and lactase and breaking it into individual monosaccharides. And then I already mentioned that people that are lactose intolerant are missing lactase. And then these protein breaking down enzymes are called aminopeptide ACEs. They're taking peptides and breaking them down into little tiny amino acids. The last step of protein digestion. This is the last step of carbohydrate digestion. And why is there no lipid digester listed here? Because lipids don't need to be digested at the wall. They're already digested out in the lumen. I think I've said that three times. It must be kind of important. And then the last enzyme that's on the wall that you need to know is enterokinase. Have you seen this before? Yes. Enterokinase isn't there to digest a protein or a carb or a lipid. It's there to activate what? Trypsin. Yep, it takes the trypsinogen that came from the pancreas and it activates it. There was that safety feature, remember? Enterokinase is stuck to the, the brush border, the wall of the small intestine, so that it doesn't accidentally float up into the pancreas and start activating enzymes in the pancreas. And then trypsin breaks down protein and activates two other enzymes, carboxypeptidase and, um, I'm having a brain fart, carboxypeptidase and chymotrypsin. Whew. Glad I pulled that out. That was embarrassing. And then the last step, the absorption. And the absorption is the process of getting it from where to where. External environment, which is the lumen, to the internal environment, which is the blood. It's trying to get into the blood. So absorption has to have the smallest particles of each of these nutrients. You have to take the big carbohydrates and break them into monosaccharides. The proteins have to be broken down to peptides and then amino acids. The triglycerides go down to monoglycerides and free fatty acids. And then these other things are already broken down. Electrolytes like sodium, potassium, chloride, anything that has a what over it? A charge, right? What would the charge be? There are two of them, positive and negative. So anything that has a little positive or negative over it, like sodium, Na+, chloride, Cl-, calcium, Ca++, those are all electrolytes. Just remember electricity, you think batteries with positive and negative charges. And then vitamins, like the fat-soluble vitamins we talked about. Do you remember the little globules of fat that transport these fat vitamins? They start with the letter M. Called micelles. So micelles are gonna transport the fat-loving vitamins. And we talked about that with the bile salt, so if you forgot that, you might wanna go back and look. And then other water-soluble vitamins, like the B vitamins and the vitamin C, they're all transported into the blood. All right, and then calcium and iron are, are interested because you don't pull in all of the calcium that you eat. You could eat a whole jar of calcium, but if you're missing a special nutrient, you can't actually transport it into your blood. Do you know what nutrient that is? It's a hormone technically, but we call it by another name. It's made in the skin, activated in the liver, and then finally activated in the kidney. Vitamin D. Yeah, so you can take in lots and lots of calcium, but if your body doesn't need it, if, or if it doesn't have enough vitamin D, you just poo it out. You literally, if you eat a whole bottle of calcium and you don't have enough vitamin D, you will literally shit a brick. There you go. And then the iron, same idea. You can take in lots of iron, but if your body doesn't need it, it just pushes it out. And it gives kind of a reddish color, like a rusty color to your, your feces. It's interesting because in pathophys, we're actually talking about digestion at the same time. So it's interesting all the things you can learn by looking at your poo. All right, and then B vitamins. The B12 is a specific one. What do you have to have for B12 to be absorbed? It's right after the word B12, actually. Intrinsic factor, where was that released from? The stomach, it had to be released in the stomach. What else is released with intrinsic factor at the same time? Hydrochloric acid, what cells did they come from? They came from the parietal cells. When you see things like this, your brain should automatically start 
clicking in the pieces you already know. Because when you get hit with like placement tests down the road, they're going to just assume that you remember everything from back in your education. So when you see something like vitamin B12, you should automatically start thinking, how do you absorb it? You have to have what present? Intrinsic factor. Where's the intrinsic factor released from? The stomach. So what kind of people might have a problem absorbing B12? People that have had stomach ulcers, gastric bypass, people that have, have had stomach problems, you might have to worry about them getting what disease it's related to B12. Pernicious anemia. So those, those pieces of information start clicking. So when you get a test, poof, your brain just goes to work. Your brain thinks like a mind map and it'll see B12 and it should automatically go back to the things you know about B12. You see intrinsic factor, you should start linking back to the things you know about intrinsic factor. All right, the circular folds, so a little bit of anatomy of the small intestine. When you're looking at the circular folds, the circular folds are not like rugae. Rugae allow the stomach to do what? Expand. The circular folds aren't there for expansion. The circular folds are there to increase surface area. For what benefit? Increasing diffusion and increasing absorption. The circular folds aren't there to make your small intestines stretch. Your small intestines aren't that stretchy compared to the stomach. They're there to increase surface area so you can diffuse things faster, like you can absorb things faster, like, um, well, I was about to say water-loving things, but you usually transport water-loving things. It'll absorb water faster, but also things like alcohol that's fat-loving absorbs faster in the small intestine. That's why if you can keep the alcohol in your stomach longer, you can break some of it down with the stomach acids and slow its absorption, as I was talking about before. The same thing with nutrients. The more surface area you have, the better you're absorbing carbs, lipids, proteins, amino acids. So the circular folds are made of these things called villi, and you can see all the little tiny bumps. If you zoom in on one of these villi, they actually have their own little villi, which are called microvilli. So you can see here's one villi, one fold, and if you look in really close at one area of this, you can see that that one little area actually has its own folds on the surface of it. So the microvilli is putting fold on top of fold on top of fold so you get this maximal surface area. All right, just underneath inside the villi, you can see all this, this yellow thing going down the middle is called a central lacteal and it's actually not part of the circulatory system. It's part of another special system that carries fluids through your body. What's that? Lymphatics. It's a lymphatic vessel. So you have this little tiny lymphatic structure in there that's trying to catch anything that doesn't go into the blood. So when you pull in things like carbohydrates as monosaccharides, they go straight into the blood, and where's the blood carry it? When you pull blood in from the GI tract, where's it automatically get carried? To the hepatic, yep, hepatic circulation, and then up to what organ? The name hepatic actually tells you. The liver, yep, it goes straight up to the liver, so they can be cleaned, processed, and stored. Remember, your, your liver's gonna store a lot of those sugars and, and proteins. But one of those nutrients can slide right by the blood vessels and get into the lacteals. What would that be? Lipids, fats. That slides right through, bypasses the liver completely, and goes right up to what organ? The heart. Yep, it goes right up to the vena cava, dumps in the vena cava right outside the right atrium, and so all those fats can flow right into the heart. Amino acids get transported into the capillaries and carried off to the liver so they can be stored as proteins. If a bacteria gets in, Ideally, the bacteria will actually go over to the lymphatics and go to what kind of structures? Lymph nodes to be processed and killed. But if they go into the blood, where, they, where do they get carried? To the liver, for what to happen to the bacteria? It gets destroyed by what special cells inside the liver? There are a special macrophage called a, sort of the K, cut for cells. Right, so there's your structure. Everything that gets absorbed either goes straight into the blood and carried off to the liver. Everything except fats. Yep. So the fats can be transported up to the heart. All right, so let's talk about the things you absorb. So sodium is absorption and reabsorption. It's passive and it's active, which means sometimes it requires energy, sometimes it doesn't. Sodium is an interesting thing because your body works actively to pull in sodium. What it does is it actually creates a pump. So it makes this pumping motion that when sodium comes in, it pulls other things with it. And I think I kind of talked about this before. As you start pulling sodium in, you'll start pulling other nutrients in, right? like water. How do you know that? 
because as you pull sodium in, why is water moving with it? Because sodium is a solute and it's attracting the water, right? As you pull the sodium into the blood, you pull the water in too. So when you eat a big bag of pretzels and you pull in all that salt, what happens to the water? It goes with it. Yeah, that's why your mouth feels really dry. You just feel like you're really thirsty because you're pulling all that salt inside of your, your blood. And as the water goes in, you just pee more of the water out. Carbohydrates, they're also pulled in. But you need a special transporter that's called a disaccharide ACE. What do you know about this transporter? It's a, or sorry, it's an enzyme, right. And that enzyme's breaking apart what? Disaccharides. Yep, so it looks kind of like this. Here's one cell in your GI tract, in your small intestine. Here's the lumen where all the food's at. You already broke down some of those carbs with, with amylases, right? You had salivary amylase, you had pancreatic amylase, so you're breaking down the sugars like starches and glycogen, starches from plants, glycogen from animals. You're breaking those down into disaccharides. Can you transport the disaccharide, or can you absorb a disaccharide? No. So as you're transporting, you're actually having to break it apart. So these disaccharides like lactose, maltose, and sucrose get transported and broken apart by lactase, maltase, and sucrase, respectively. But the trick is that they need a little tiny bit of sodium to work with it. So the sugar, lactose, comes up to that transporter. A sodium comes up to the transporter. They bind together, and together they're like a key. As they move through the transporter, the sodium's transported in, and the disaccharides split in half. So in reality, what you're doing is you're bringing in one sodium, one glucose, and one galactose. These are monosaccharides. Here's where it gets tricky. So the first week of class, I talked about secondary active transport. Secondary active means that part of it's active, but another part's not. Up here, this is not active transport. It's going on a concentration gradient where you have a lot of salt and a lot of sugar in your GI tract. So if you just ate a, um, something that's real salty and sweet, right? Like a payday bar, or what's the other version of it? Nut roll. Payday's or nut rolls that are like lots of salt, lots of sugar, and lots of proteins. Right, so you have lots of sugar and salt here. The sugar and the salt are transported across. Now you have a high abundance of sugar and salt inside the cell. These have hit equilibrium. Do they still want to move? Nope. So what you do, what your, your body does, your cell does, is it starts pumping the sodium on the opposite side of the cell. Not on the lumen side, but actually on the blood vessel side. So it's pumping salt into the interstitial space, and now interstitial space is filling with salt, and that salt can move into the capillary and be carried off. Well, now you're transporting the salt. As you're pulling that, you're gonna pull more salt in here because you're lowering the concentration gradient here so it's, everything's gonna flow from high to medium and then down into the interstitial space. What's kind of cool about this is that means you can keep pumping sugar in. As the sugar starts filling up, you can actually move passively the sugar into the bloodstream. So it's because of that little tiny pump over here in the corner that sodium and sugar keep flowing through, just a constant flow. It's almost like if you've ever siphoned water. If you create flow on one side or a suction on one side, once the water gets going, it just keeps going and going and going. And that's what's happening with the sodium. You're creating a pump on this side. It's like siphoning, pulling the salt from the lumen into the cell and then over and out to the blood. And the sugar just passively follows along. Secondary active transport is because you use energy at this location, which makes it passively move at this location. All three of these work exactly the same way. This one's just moving lactose. This one's moving maltose the same way with sodium. And this one's moving sucrose exactly the same way with sodium. All those monosaccharides accumulate in the cell and then they get pumped into the blood where they get carried off to the system and they get stored as what? What's the storage form of these sugars? It starts with a G. Glycogen, glycogen. They get stored in the liver. They get stored in the, in the uh, muscle cells. So that if you need them later, you can use them. Does your brain store sugar? Nope. So your brain's going to be one of the primary controllers of the flow of the sugar. If the brain needs the sugar, it ups the flow. If it doesn't need it, it slows it down a little bit. And we talked about that already when we talked about um, cephalic control. Right, so if I asked you a question about carb digestion, what would be true?
Okay, there's about 30 seconds, so which of these is true? Carb digestion starts in the mouth in the presence of pepsin. True or false? False. Does it start in the mouth? Yes, in the presence of amylase. So you know number one is wrong, get rid of that. How about number two? Carb digestion continues in the stomach with the enzyme enterokinase or interkinase. Does carb digestion continue in the stomach? Just briefly. But what do you know about the carbs in the stomach? They stop getting digested because the enzymes are shut off. Where's enterokinase, by the way, or interkinase? That's in the small intestine, so this doesn't even make any sense. Does enterokinase break apart carbohydrates? Nope. Enterokinase activates trypsin. So that's all kinds of wrong. Number two is. Number three, carb digestion is completed when it passes through the small intestine wall. Is the last step of carb digestion in the lumen of the small intestine or on the wall of the small intestine? It's on the wall. Yep, so it's those enzymes. If it's lactose, if that's the carbohydrate, what's the enzyme that breaks it apart on the wall? If it's lactose, the enzyme is lactase. If it's maltose, the enzyme is maltase. And if it's sucrose, the enzyme is sucrase. So they just tell you. So it looks like that one's right. Number three looks like the right answer. How about number four? Does it require an acidic environment for it to, to occur? Not at all. In the mouth when carb digestion happens, the environment's what? pretty neutral. It's like at seven. It's pretty neutral and normal, so it's not acidic. How about in the stomach? Does carb digestion happen in the stomach where it's acidic? No. The acids actually shut off carb digestion. And then how about the small intestine? That environment's slightly basic. Yep. So the carbs are digested either in the mouth where it's pretty neutral or in the small intestine where it's basic, not acidic at all. Number four is completely wrong. Number three is your right answer. Proteins. If you spend time understanding how carbs are digested and absorbed, it looks exactly the same. Where's protein first starting to get digested at in your body? In the stomach, right? Under the influence of pepsin. So you eat it in the stomach, you start digesting with pepsin. Once it gets into the small intestine, the pancreatic proteolytic enzymes like trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase start breaking it down. Those are in the lumen. Once you get those small peptides to the wall, at the wall, there's a special enzyme called an amino peptide ace. What's it telling you it's breaking apart? Peptides, right? So it's taking the peptides and turning it into amino acids or transporting amino acids. So these small peptides are going to meet up at the wall. They get transported in, and they forgot to put this over here, but look what else gets transported in with amino acids and peptides. Sodium. It's exactly the same as carbs. So it's passively moving in during these transporters with sodium, which means what has to be somewhere else? Passively moved here, actively moved over here. So here again, you have that same sodium transport that's pulling sodium into the interstitial fluid and then into the capillaries. So the amino acids can go into the capillaries based on their concentration gradient. Where are all these amino acids, all these carbs, and all this salt being carried to first? The liver. It's exactly the same process for carbs and proteins. You just have to change the name of the uh, transporters up here. So if I ask you a question like this, protein digestion, which is correct. How about number one? Protein digestion begins in the mouth under the influence of saliva. What's in the saliva that causes digestion? Amylase. Does that break apart proteins? Nope. Where does protein digestion start? In the stomach. So how about number two? Begins in the stomach under the influence of trypsinogen. True or false? False. Why? It does begin in the stomach under the influence of Pepsin. Number two is wrong. How about number three? Protein digestion requires trypsin, chymotrypsin, carboxypeptidase in the small intestine. 
Where do those three things break down? Trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. They're all what type of enzymes? They're all proteolytic enzymes released from the pancreas. Proteolytic means they're digesting what? Proteins. So protein digestion requires trypsin, chymotrypsin, and carboxypeptidase. That's true. How about number four? Just in case you were questioning number three, how about number four? Protein digestion ends in the lumen of the small intestine. Where does it end? On the wall of the, di of the small intestine. So number four is wrong. One, two, and four are wrong. Three is correct. And then fats. So fats start as triglycerides. When you eat that big cheeseburger and that grease, or whatever you eat that's full of fats, they're packed with triglycerides. They're complex fat. So next you have to introduce them to bile. What does bile do? It takes that complex fat and splits it into small little globules. What are those little globules called? It starts with the letter M. Micelles. Yep. What's the process that bile salts turn triglycerides into micelles? Emulsification. So there are your terms. You've already seen these two terms before. And the next thing we're going to do is we're going to turn those micelles, once they're inside the cell, we're going to turn them into something special called a chylomicron. So let me show you. Here you eat that bowling ball sized piece of fat, right? It goes down into your stomach and your small intestine. And then the bile salts emulsify them into little tiny marble sized bits. So they're small, microscopic compared to that huge particle it originally was. Then the pancreatic lipase comes along and actually digests it. It splits a triglyceride into monoglyceride and what's? Free fatty acids, yep. So you had three fatty acids dangling on this glyceride molecule. Now you have a monoglyceride and two free fatty acids. They're all small, tiny particles. They can be transported easily. So they come up to the wall, they meet up with each other, and this wall here is zoomed in. Now you see the wall, and you have this little ball of micelles, right? Or this micelle ball. It has fatty acids, monoglycerides, it has vitamin A, D, E, and K, it has cholesterol. Anything that's fat loving that's getting ready to go into your blood, it's hiding inside the micelles. The micelle hits the wall and passively just moves right through it because it's what loving? It's fat loving. Yeah, it's fat loving. So these phospholipid walls here, it just slides right through. There's nothing stopping the micelle from going right through your intestinal wall. So now we're inside this intestine wall. This is the cell. Those fatty acids, those monoglycerides, they start getting together and they start recombining into a triglyceride. So now they're back into a triglyceride. These triglycerides are kind of sticky, they're kind of big. And so what the cell does, it says, we need to package this thing. We need to make it some way that we can transport it safely through the blood. Because otherwise, if that triglyceride just gets in your bloodstream, it can stick anywhere. It can move anywhere at once. So what happens is the cell will take the triglycerides, the fats, and start studying them. They put little proteins around the outside. So it's almost like taking this bowling ball and bedazzling it, right? You've got all these little shiny, sparkly things on the outside of it, which make it easily identifiable by the body. Now this thing's called a chylomicron. These are super significant in health. Chylomicrons, once they're in the bloodstream, they either have a couple proteins on them or they have a ton of proteins. So either they've been slightly bedazzled or they've been extremely bedazzled. The ones that are slightly bedazzled, these things are very floaty. The proteins, the little things that you're sticking on the chylomicrons, they're, they're like weights or anchors. Because otherwise this fat will just go anywhere at once. It'll stick to anything at once and move inside. The proteins prevent it from sticking. The ones that have a low density protein stuck to them are going to be floaty. They're still going to stick to the walls of your arteries. What do we call those low density special things? Low density lipoproteins. Because they're a lipid, right? They're full of lipids, but they have proteins stuck on the outside. So now we call it a lipoprotein. So the chylomicrons fall into two major groups, LDLs and HDLs. The ones that are low density with very few proteins, they're sticky and good or bad for you? They're bad for you. The LDLs are the ones that stick in the blood vessels, they clog the arteries, they're bad for you. If your intestinal wall is doing a great job of converting those into high density, it sticks lots of studs on the, the surface, lots of those little bedazzled things. It makes it heavy, it makes it bulky, and also makes it more water loving so you can easily clear them from your system. They don't stick to the walls. Those are high density, they're very heavy, 
with proteins, so they're called them HDLs. So chylomicrons are something you'll definitely want to remember down the road. HDLs and LDLs. Genetically, either your body's really good at studying these things or it's not. The people that aren't really good at studying these things, what disorders might they get down the road? Yep, artery diseases, they get heart disease, a lot of atherosclerosis. When you test their blood, they're high in LDLs. They don't process fats very well. Some people, they can eat bacon every morning for breakfast until they're 95. Wash it down for dinner with a big old cheeseburger or Big Mac. And they die with a nice clean you know, set of arteries. I always think of grumpy old men, Burgess Meredith. He's like, ah, oh, I smoked for 30 years or whatever, or smoked my entire life, and I've eaten bacon and eggs for breakfast for my entire life. And he was like 90-some when he died. But that's it. If you're genetically prone to have bad you know, cholesterol levels, it's because your body can't make these chylomicrons very well. That's one of the reasons, actually. And then the last thing you want to notice about this is that those chylomicrons, they're not transported into the capillaries. They're transported into the central lacteal, which is part of what system? The lymphatics. So where are they getting shuttled to? Straight up to the vena cava and the heart, right? So they're going right into the heart. Some of those free fatty acids can be moved into the capillary. They go to the liver, and then they're stored in the liver for fats. Right, so what do you know about fat digestion? How about number one? Fat digestion occurs in the lumen of the small intestine. True or false? Fat digestion, does it occur on the wall of the small intestine or in the lumen? Wow, nobody wants to answer that one. Well, let's skip it then. How about number two? Does it require pepsin? Nope, pepsin breaks apart proteins. Is fat digested in the stomach? Nope, everything about number two is wrong. How about fat digestion occurs in an acidic environment? What did you just tell me about the stomach? Yeah, fat doesn't happen in the acidic environment of the stomach, so number three is wrong. How about number four? Needs bile that is made in the pancreas. Does bile digest fat? It emulsifies at number one. What makes this completely wrong? Needs bile that is made in the pancreas. Bile is made in the liver. Yep. So even if that was seemed tricky because it well technically it's emulsification, what made that completely wrong? Bile is not made in the pancreas. Is bile made in the gallbladder? Nope, it's stored, exactly, it's stored in the gallbladder. So number four is wrong. Fat digestion happens in the lumen under the influence of what enzyme? What's the enzyme that digests fat? Lipase that came from the pancreas, right? It doesn't need to be digested on the wall. It just easily penetrates through the wall. Number one is the correct answer. All right, vitamin absorption. I kind of mentioned this already, but water-soluble vitamins, things like vitamin C. What are the other group of vitamins that we associate with water-soluble? I'll give you a hint. It's water-soluble if you eat it, and a half hour later it turns your pee yellow because you're peeing it out, right? Nobody knows. Nobody takes vitamins. My favorite thing about B vitamins is that when you take a B vitamin supplement, there are always so many B vitamins you don't need. Half hour later, your urine is like neon yellow. I just want to put a, like a black light in the bathroom just to see that in there. So it glows, woo, like radioactive. But the water soluble vitamins like C and the B vitamins, they get transported across the wall of the lumen. The fat soluble vitamins, what were the four of them? A, D, E, and K. They hide in what little structures to get absorbed? M word. It's the third time I've asked you today. Micelles. Yep. So the fat loving ones, A, D, E, and K, they get absorbed in the micelles along with cholesterol. The other thing you want to know, water soluble vitamins cannot be stored. What's that tell you? You need to take them in every day, right? So you need to eat things like vegetables especially to get your B and C's. Like broccoli is surprisingly high in vitamin C. You should be eating fruits and vegetables every day to take in water-soluble vitamins, like C's and the B vitamins. What else carries B vitamins that vegetarians don't get? I guess I kind of gave that away. Red meats. Yeah, meat, red meat actually is really high in 
and certain B vitamins. And then fat soluble vitamins, they can be stored. So that actually means that they can also be dangerous. They can be dangerous. They can be toxic. You can actually get too much vitamin A, too much vitamin E, too much vitamin K. They can be stored in parts of your body and become toxic. All right, iron absorption is selective. You don't absorb every bit of iron you take in. You absorb what you need. The unfortunate thing is if, if you're female, if you're eating iron or you're eating foods with iron, your body will take it in. But what happens to you every month? You, yeah, exactly. You bleed a lot from menstruation and you lose a lot of that iron. So iron intake is about 15 to 20 milligrams a day is how much we take in on average. But for men, we absorb about a half to one milligram a day. And for women, about one to one and a half milligrams a day. It's because of the difference in blood loss. And then the next two terms, ferritin and transferrin. F-E, I always put a block around that, which means it stands, it's the chemical symbol for iron. Yep. So the ferritin, or ferrin, which is iron, or ferrous if it's activated iron, is in, this, in both of these words. Ferritin is the storage form of iron in your body. Transferrin is the transport form of iron in your body. So about every three days, you'll store it in the wall of the intestine. Here's your intestinal wall. You store that iron in here. If your body needs it, it'll pull it into the blood and transport it to places like the bone and the liver. If it doesn't need it, about three days later, it'll kick it back out into the GI tract, and then you poo it out. It gives your feces kind of a reddish-brown tint, like a rusty color. When you transport it to the bone, it has to be attached to something because iron doesn't want to easily move through the plasma. So it gets stuck to a, a protein and it's transported as transferrin, transported ferritin. And it gets moved. Why would it be moved to the bone? Why, keep, why do I keep saying bone? What's happening to iron in your bone? Or more specifically, in your bone marrow? You're making red blood cells, exactly. So you're making a lot of red blood cells. So ferritin is the storage form, transferrin is the transport form. And then calcium, of course, what hormone do you have to have to absorb calcium? <coughs> vitamin D. It's a hormone. It's made in the body. We call it vitamin D, but it's a hormone that's made in the skin, activated in the liver, and then finally activated in the kidney. I think I've mentioned that several times, but those are three significant organs. So much so that we're going to talk about them again when we come back from spring break and talk about urine, we'll talk about the kidney and vitamin D. And then the last week of class, when we the last weeks of class, when we're talking about hormones, we'll come back and talk about vitamin D again. All right, so you have to have vitamin D for calcium absorption. It has to be the activated form too. Um, if you take a vitamin, if you take a calcium supplement, a lot of times they'll put something called calcitrol in it, which is the active form of vitamin D, just in case. So every day you take in about 1,000 milligrams, <coughs> excuse me, 1,000 milligrams, but you actually only absorb about two-thirds of it. If you have more vitamin D, you absorb more. If you have less vitamin D, you absorb less. The rest is just lost in the feces. Okay, so the extent of absorption in the small intestine keeps pace with, secre or pace with secretion. That's what I started today off talking about. You're secreting all of these fluids, pancreatic fluids, saliva, gastric fluids, all these fluids are being pushed in, sucus and tericus from the small intestine, all being pushed into the GI tract. You have to reabsorb those. So you're constantly exchanging back and forth, pushing fluids in from the plasma, reabsorbing into the plasma. So every day about almost 10 liters of fluid, nine, nine and a half liters, so 9,500 milliliters of water and cellulose go into the small intestine. 7,000 of those are borrowed from the plasma, which means that you have to reabsorb those constantly. The only secretory prod, product that you get rid of is going to be um, bilirubin. Where does bilirubin come from, by the way? Red blood cells, yep. When the liver breaks down red blood cells, it uses some of it as bile and it puts the rest out into the, the feces. Okay, so biochemical balance among the small intestine, the stomach, the pancreas, they're all in balance. If you don't keep everything in balance, you get an acid-base abnormality, which is also what we'll talk about when we get back from break. We may have a little time to talk about it today. So this 
picture is kind of confusing because what they did is they took your stomach and your small intestine and the large intestine and just smashed them all together. So here you have the stomach. The parietal cells that are releasing hydrochloric acid are pushing the HCl out here. As it gets down into the small intestines, it's going to be neutralized with bicarbonate and sodium bicarbonate we were talking about before. That's What cells do that come from out of the pancreas? Right. Duct cells, right. Good job. So it comes from the duct cells, and then this hydrochloric acid and this bicarbonate meet up, and they get neutralized. When it gets to the end of the small intestine and the end of the large intestine, the intestinal cells will reabsorb all of that. It reabsorbs the bicarbonate, reabsorbs the sodium, reabsorbs the chloride, reabsorbs the hydrogen. All of them are pulled back into that same equation that you've seen a, you know, a dozen times now, and then reabsorbed back into the body. They're all recycled, all brought back in. What goes into the intestinal tract has to come back into the blood eventually. Diarrhea screws that up. So diarrhea accelerates things through your GI tract. Diarrhea is good for you to an extent. It's good for you because obviously something's in your GI tract that shouldn't be, and why do you have diarrhea? To try and purge it, to get rid of it. You're trying to rush it through. So if you have uh, toxic bacteria or you have toxins in there, or you ate something that was poisonous or harmful to you, diarrhea helps you get rid of it. Unfortunately, diarrhea just rushes everything through. It rushes the nutrients through with it, so a lot of times with diarrhea, people start getting a nutritional imbalance. It rushes the electrolytes through, so they're losing electrolytes. But also those things that you just loaned the GI tract are lost. Diarrhea is coming out the bottom end, not the stomach side, right? So when all the stuff you're putting into the small intestine and large intestine, like sodium bicarbonate, is being lost the most, not acid. So if you're losing lots of sodium bicarbonate, what becomes more powerful in your blood? Acids. What state do you fall into? Alkalosis or acidosis? Acidosis. You're losing the bases, so the acids become powerful. What was it in, in vomiting? What became more powerful in your blood? The alkalines. They're just the opposite. If you vomit a lot, you get metabolic alkalosis. If you have diarrhea a lot, you get metabolic acidosis. And of course, with diarrhea, it's very watery, so that means this, the large intestine didn't get a chance to absorb all the water. So what other risk do you have? Dehydration. Yep. So diarrhea, loss of fluid and electrolytes. Also anything that was secreted into the small and large intestine, like bases, sodium bicarbonate. It's good because it gets rid of the bad stuff, but it's bad because you have a higher risk of metabolic acidosis and um, losing sodium bicarbonate at a brain fart. Okay, and the last one, large intestine. This is a pretty in-depth one, so hold on. What's the whole purpose of the small intestine? A absorb moisture, right? It's, it's basically like a big sponge squeezing this food that's already been digested. Everything important, like nutrients, has already been absorbed. All you're reabsorbing is water and a couple salts here. So it's taking this feces and it's squeezing it, like wringing a sponge, and it's pulling as much moisture as it possibly can out, bring it back into the blood. Anatomically, you can see it follows this long pathway, so it's just moving along slowly, getting more and more and more compact. As it first moves into the cecum, it's going to pull some water out. It goes up the what? Ascending. Across means transverse, and then down would be descending until it goes into this S-shaped curve, which is called the sigmoid colon, and then finally into the rectum. And then you have a special group of muscles here that help form the anus to push the substance out. All right, so we're going to talk about that process moving along. First, the motility. As you're moving it across here and squeezing, it's actually called postural contractions. That'd be the equivalent of the mixing motility. Postural contractions. Each of these bumps are called a hostra. So when the, when the food substance, it's not food anymore, this fecal substance gets in there, the hostra will squeeze, almost like wringing it, and pull the water out. And then when it's ready, it'll push it along just a little bit. And then squeeze the next batch, and then push it along a little bit, and squeeze the next batch. On average, you put about 500 milliliters of chyme from the small intestine into the large intestine, so that means 500 milliliters have to move forward and forward and forward until finally that gets moved into this most processed part, gets moved into the rectum. Once the food moves into the rectum, no, I keep saying food, the fecal matter, hopefully it's not like whole carrots anymore, but who knows. Once it gets down here, the, the rectum shouldn't have any fecal matter in it. Once fecal matter moves in here, it starts distending the rectum, and then you have this defecation reflex that happens. So you have these mechanoreceptors that detect a stretch that shouldn't normally be happening. It sends a signal up to the spinal cord. 
it's a reflex, right? So you have a, a pathway that goes to the spinal cord, another pathway that comes back. What pathway would that be? A sympathetic or parasympathetic pathway? Which one's responsible for digesting and defecation and parasympathetic? Yeah, if you're so afraid, your sympathetic nervous system kicks in and you crap your pants, it's because you should have done that before you were afraid, basically. You're already feeling the need to do it, and it was basically your body's way of saying, just let it rip because we're going to run for our life. Pull the ripcord. It's paradoxical defecation. That's not a normal response. I mean, I want to say by show of hands, how many people have crapped their pants when they're afraid, but I'm going to go ahead and skip that show of hands part. right? Because it doesn't normally happen. It doesn't happen to most people. It's that if there was already something in the rectum, then it's just pushed out because you're afraid and you tighten muscles. So this response, like I was trying to say, mechanical receptors send a signal up. Would that be an efferent or afferent pathway, by the way? Up, going into the spinal cord. Afferent pathway, and then the efferent signal comes back, and here's where it gets interesting. So the efferent signal comes back, and it will actually relax the internal anal sphincter. The internal anal sphincter is smooth muscle. Is that voluntary or involuntary? It's involuntary. You don't have control over that. As soon as the rectum starts distending, that reflex starts relaxing the internal anal sphincters. At that point, basically, you're about to defecate. Thankfully, the external anal sphincter, the outside one, is skeletal muscle. What does that tell you? Voluntary. You have control. So as that signal goes into the spinal cord, it goes up to the brain, and the brain goes, whoa, this is not the place for this to happen, right? So it sends a signal back down and tells you to squeeze the external anal sphincter. So you have skeletal control squeezing that until you get to the appropriate place to relieve yourself. That's a, it's, the internal anal sphincter is instinctive. It's like babies, they don't have control. Their pathway from the brain down to the lower part of the spinal cord hasn't developed completely. So when they get that instinct, it just goes, right? Babies, puppies, kittens, whatever, they just automatically go. But as they learn, as they're growing, then they have control of that external anal sphincter and they can stop it so that they don't you know, poop in their pants or if it's a puppy, it doesn't poop in the kennel with itself because they don't like that. They, don't, they prefer not to live in their own feces. Right? But what happens if you have spinal cord damage and you can't send a signal from your brain down to the spinal column? Yep, the internal anal sphincter. So if somebody has spinal cord damage, if, if food moves into the rectum, the involuntary response takes over and it'll just come out. Right? So the main purpose of the large intestine, again, was for drying and storing. And then the movement, hostile contra contractions are the mixing, quote unquote. They're not mixing anything, they're just pulling water out and then mass movements that move at about 500 milliliters at a time. The mass movement would be the propulsive. There's no digestion. Digestion's all completely done. The enzymes have been broken down and reabsorbed already, so the enzymes aren't working in there. I mean, technically, there is digestion going on, but it's not you digesting any food in there. What's digesting food in there? Bacteria. Yep. Bacteria is breaking down some things that you didn't break down, and in some situations it's actually processing hormones. But it's not you digesting anything. And in the secretion, you have an alkaline. What's this HCO3 negative? What is that? You should know this by now. It's bicarbonate. So it has an alkaline bicarbonate mucus solution just basically is a lubricant to help the food move through. Feces move through. I keep saying it, food. And then finally the absorption is primarily water. And then I've already talked about the defecation reflex. So feces are eliminated by the defecation reflex. The mass movement pushes feces into the rectum. The rectum is distended, sending a signal by stretch receptors, the mechanoreceptors, up to the spinal cord. That signal comes back, relaxing the internal anal sphincters, which are made of what kind of muscle? Smooth. And then the external anal sphincters are relaxed only if your brain wants you to relax. That's because they're what kind of muscle? They're skeletal muscle. Right, so if it's in the appropriate time and place. Constipation is if you don't allow that to move through or if something's slowing down movement, it just keeps pulling more and more water up, out doing what to the feces, making it extremely dry and compact. So it becomes problematic then. So a lot of anxiety, which is turning up what system? Parasympathetic or sympathetic? Sympathetic. Consistent fear, um, consistent stress. Anytime that you're on a high adrenaline rush for a long time, all those things are doing what to the, the movement through the digestive tract? Slowing it down, giving you more time to dry the feces and making it more compact. So people that are high stress for a long time, a lot of times they get constipated. 
So now we know that depression and anxiety cause constipation. Moral of the story is don't get worked up around tests because it could be bad for your rectum. And then flatus or flatulence, that's when gas is expelled. What's interesting is there are actually five valves in the rectum. So that gas can move through, but feces doesn't move through. So as gas starts moving through the rectum, it can move from one valve to the next without actually causing defecation response. But what has to happen with flatus is that the signal has to come from up above to relax the external anal sphincter. So when that happens, you tighten the abdominal muscles, you tighten the diaphragm, and basically it's like we talked about with vomiting, except this time you relax the external anal sphincter and then, there it is. So the next time you're sitting on the couch with a loved one and you're watching a movie and you hear, right? And they say, oops, it was an accident. <laughs> was it really an accident? You look at them and go, liar! And they can explain this. You can say, actually, unless you have spinal cord damage, you have control of the external anal sphincter, and that means you intentionally did that, you lie in SOB, and it stinks. Right? So if they can get up and walk across the room, they are a liar. Okay. So we're done with section eight, which means you should do what? Take care of the quiz by the time we come back, which is spring break, after spring break. All right, let's go ahead and get started with acid bases, which is number nine. Oh, I'll break these apart here real quick.